So here with Sam Houston, head coach, Casey Keeler. Uh, coach Keeler, first off, before we get going, I was talking to head coach at Sam, uh, Stephen F. Austin, Coach Carthel, because uh, I do both of your previews uh, for the magazine. Um, and he wanted to know, or he wanted to let you know he was a little jealous of uh, the budget, you know, that you get at Sam Houston because it kind of gets a little elevated because of the senior discount that you get at, at food stuff. He wanted me to point that out to you. Let me, let me get this. Do they have football, Stephen, at Boston? It's tough to compare when you, I mean, like it's apples and oranges. I know they have basketball, really good basketball. I didn't know they had football. No, I, I love Colby. I mean, I think he's done a phenomenal job. And uh, boy, you know, what a great game we had last year. And it seems like every game we've had with them recently has been, you know, just throwing haymakers at each other. And, and I always tell every recruit, you know, all about that game because it is such an amazing rivalry. And, you know, for four hours, and I save hate for like world hunger. Um, I do not use hate a lot, but for four hours, there's two, two teams that literally, they, they hate each other. And it's pretty cool. And it's one of the great rivalries in the country and it, it's coming to an end, which is sad. But at the same time, you know, I think, uh, our move to Conference USA makes a lot of sense, and it's the kind of things you have to do when you're moving up. How much does that help the rivalry to kind of have that good-natured, friendly ability to kind of rib with the other coach? I, I would think that it kind of gives fans some ammo and just kind of makes the game a little bit more fun for everybody. Yeah, I think people are surprised. You know, I mean, after the, the SFA game this past year, uh, my wife and I spent time with Colby and his wife, uh, you know, uh, in the parking lot, you know, uh, where the buses weren't too far away. You know, he was hopping in his personal car home. I was hopping in my personal car home. And, uh, you know, we just sat and talked for like 15, 20 minutes. So uh, a lot of respect for what he's done there. Um, and I know he has a lot of respect for what we've done here. And, um, you know, I just think he's a really good football coach. And that program keeps on getting better and better. I was doing some some research on you and I, and I was looking at your hometown, but I have no idea how to pronounce it. How do you pronounce uh, your hometown? Is it M I S? How do you even say it? Emmaus. 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 Okay. Back in the day, they called it Emmaus, but it's called it's known as Emmaus. Very Pennsylvania Dutch. That's okay. uh, kind of uh, that area is very Pennsylvania Dutch. It's the Lehigh Valley area. Uh, it's about maybe you know an hour above Philadelphia. Uh, so that. That's where, you know, I coached at Rowan University in South Jersey, and then I coached at Delaware. And so I've kind of been in that tri-state area most of my life, played at Delaware. Um, but, you know, this has been nine years now here in Texas. So I think when you're here nine years, I think you can call yourself a Texan. Uh, you may need one more. You may, you may I, need yeah, to I get. Need, I, need 10. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> you made it get what was the biggest adjustment or like the biggest kind of culture shock when you got to Huntsville I'd imagine maybe the food or the people like what was what was different well, I, I tell this this story you know uh, John Perry who's now my offensive coordinator had just gotten to the Texans when I got to Sam Houston he was the receivers coach and, and tight ends coach there for seven years with Bill O'Brien so we got the wives together uh, in the woodlands and I remember the very first thing he said to me was is everyone so prideful that now you're part of Texas? I said, absolutely. Everyone's like, hey, what do you think about being a Texan? And hey, you know, isn't this cool that you're, you know, living in Texas now? And then the second thing he said is, uh, how much weight have you put on? I said, yeah, I mean, there's, all the, there's all the barbecue and all the Tex-Mex. And the third thing he said, which was very telling, he goes, do they ask you if this was your first summer? I go, yeah, they ask me if this is my first summer. And then they kind of giggle and walk away where I tell them it is my first summer. There's something about these summers. So, uh, yeah, um, and we found out in our first summer. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's pretty interesting. But uh, now it's, again, you know, I, I came, the first person who called me uh, when I got off the plane uh, here in Texas was Dick Vermeil. I was the last cut with Dick Vermeil uh, with the Philadelphia Eagles uh, back in like 82, 83, whatever it was. And um, he said, you're living a dream. You're, you're going to be a college football coach in the greatest high school football hotbed in the nation. And he's right. You know, when I stand on the 50-yard line at, at uh, Bauer Stadium and I draw a three-and-a-half-hour radius around where I'm standing, there's no school in the country who can say they have better football than, than we do. And I think that's one of the reasons why we feel very comfortable that the move to Conference USA makes sense because – our location is just amazing and the school just keeps on growing and the things that have happened here since I've been here, you know, we've gone from 15,000 students to 22,000 students, you know, since I've been here. 
I mean, the facilities that we built since I've been here are just amazing. So um, yeah, it's a great place and, and I'm, I'm proud to be a Bearcat. I would imagine you kind of feel the same way when it gets cold and schools start shutting down when it's like 55 degrees outside that we've never had a winter. Well, you know, it's funny the, the kids all get after me because I, I'm wearing a sweatshirt at 50, 50 degrees. I'm wearing a sweatshirt. And I'm like, there you I are a Texan. Oh, I'm not, I can't stand this cold weather. Like, coach, it's 50 degrees out. I know it's freezing. Uh, but, uh, you know, I still have a, a daughter and, and, and grandson back east. And uh, uh, so we get back there and uh, we try to get, you know, the, we, we try to all get together at Christmas time. You know, we go to Rehoboth Beach. We try to get my son comes in from L.A. and we all get there. And inevitably, it's like I couldn't do this cold anymore. Like I just could not live in the cold. I mean, I'm just so used to this weather now. Uh, so they all make fun of me because they say I've gotten soft. <laughs> um, you know, to go back a little bit, you were you're a really good linebacker at Delaware, part of a national championship team. What was the scouting report on Casey Keeler, the linebacker back in the day? Probably the hair undersized, you know, 5'11 and a half, about 215 pounds, uh, could run. I mean, I could run. I mean, that was the thing that, you know, I was very explosive. I could really run. Uh, and if you knew anything about me, I just loved the game. I just loved the game. I just loved playing. And so uh, I didn't know if I'd ever go into coaching. That was not my trajectory. Um, I met a young lady. I just got cut by the Philadelphia Eagles for the second time. Decided that like I was done playing football. I mean, I last cut four times in, in professional fo football. And I took a job interview up in New York City uh, selling paper products. And I came back physically ill. I mean, I was physically ill from coming, you know, and, and my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, said to me, she goes, you can't do this. She says, you, you, you want to coach. And I said, well, I kind of think I do. And so she found a grad school for me. She actually put me through grad school and I got an opportunity to, to coach there then Glassboro State, now Rowan University, they changed names. And I then became the head coach there. And then with the success I had there, I got the opportunity to go to the University of Delma, my alma mater. So yeah, my, my wife, I, I remind her when, when she complains about, you know, me not being home or, you know, the hours I'm putting in, it's like, remember, I could have had me selling paper products, but instead you decided that you were going to put me through grad school. So you play at Delaware, right? And then you come back and coach at Delaware. I guess what are the kind of pressures of following kind of a legendary head coach there that you played under and it's your alma mater? And you're changing offenses from the wing team to the spread. Kind of what was that time like in your career? Well, I mean, I would pinch myself every day that I became the head coach at my alma mater. I mean, I would literally pull up to the facility and just pinch myself. It was so cool. And, and you know, following on a legend is hard. I mean, I think it's harder than anyone could even imagine, especially when that legend sits right behind you on game day. Um, and the field is named after him. I remember the very first game I coached, they said, oh, by the way, we're going to name the field after Tubby. Uh, Tubby Raymond was the guy I, I played for. And I'm like, my first game, we're going to name the field after Tubby? I said, well, who are we playing? We're playing Georgia Southern. They're number three in the country. Okay, so I'm coming off a team that just went four and six, a team that we're going to totally change the offense, complete different skill set, and we're looking for them what the wing T is. And I'm bringing a brand new defense into. Basically, the whole staff is going to be brand new. Um, and my last time I coached a game was as a division three coach. I'm now, you know, an FCS coach, a lot of moving parts. And, but you had to win that game. I mean, you, you literally for the, for the trajectory or for the, for the legacy of Delaware football, you had to win that game. And we did, we found a way to beat Georgia Southern the number three ranked team in the country opening day. Um, and I think Tubby was shocked because they had gotten beaten pretty, pretty good the year before down at their place. Uh, but it was just one of those games where when you're naming the field after a legendary coach, you had to win that game. And we, had, we found a way to win that game. I remember what I was going to ask you. you. You had mentioned uh, getting cut a few times in your professional career. You know, kind of what was that like? What do you remember about those times? I mean, did it did it depress you? Did it challenge you? Kind of like what, what, what was that kind of, I guess, process like for you as a person? Well, I, I was very proud of the fact that I transitioned from a 218 pound linebacker to 188 pound safety and went down to the last cut where they cut a fifth round draft choice and cut a veteran before they cut me. So, I mean, I was very proud. I mean, I, you know, it's kind of, I'm a, I'm a glass half full guy. 
um, I look at life maybe a little differently, you know? And so obviously I wish I had made the team, but I was very proud and I knew I put everything into it. I mean, I couldn't have done any more reps on the, on the bench press. I couldn't have done any more sprints. I couldn't, you know, couldn't have studied more film, you know, all those things. I, I remember getting up at five in the morning to put myself in ice baths up to my neck just so I could, you know, make sure I wasn't going to miss a practice. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, again, that's how I kind of look at life. And, and I look at like, what a great experience. And let's move on to my next chapter in life. And that's what I did. Now, speaking of experience, what are, you know, one or two things that went on in a 1980s NFL training camp that may get you put in jail if you try to do nowadays? Yeah, I don't know if I can even say the things. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, you know, you're, we started training camp like July 8th or so. And I got kept cut like September 1st. I mean, you're, you're like in training camp forever. Yeah. And so this is Dick Vermeil and everything is organized. Everything is, I mean, and we're going, we're going we're to finish meetings like 11 o'clock at night. You know I mean? It's all day. It's every, it's, it's double sessions. And, and I can remember my roommate was a guy named Wes Hopkins who ended up being a NFL defensive player of the year, um, you know, a year or two after they drafted him. He pulls his hamstring. Uh, the very first, either first day of training camp or just before training camp started. And so I'm just getting the daylight speeding at me every single day. And I'm waking up and this guy's driving a brand new Porsche 928. And he knows he has the team made. And I just wanted to, I wanted to like strangle him, but he was such a great guy. He was a you know, great guy. And, and uh, so, but yeah, there was a lot of shenanigans that took uh, place in the training camps when, especially when you have a group of men kind of sequestered, uh, for almost two months. I mean, it can be kind of crazy. Yeah, no social media or any of that kind of stuff to get it leaked out there. So, you know, secrets will die, I suppose. Uh, and then, you know, you you leave Delaware, you come to Sam Houston, you know, we kind of talked about that transition to Texas, like how quickly, and maybe it was before you even took the job, how quickly did you know, like, we can really, we can win championships and build this into something that, you know, maybe people before didn't know Sam Houston could be? Yeah, I was commentating for ESPN, I think a lot of people thought I was going to ride off into the sunset and, and doing that. I was working for NFL films and the matchup show and I was having fun, but it wasn't being around the fellas. It wasn't like trying to put a team together. It wasn't about the community. It, it, you know, so, um, but when Bobby Williams recruited me to come here, we talked about national championships. I mean, I was like, listen, I have no interest in doing this unless that's the vision of the program. And, you know, I remember my very first press conference at, at Delaware and David Roselle, the president said, listen, they're coming off a four and six season. You're changing the offense. You're changing the defense. You have a whole new coaching staff. Do not like promise them anything. And I got up there and said, I'm here to win championships. I said, national championships. And I said, we will win them sooner rather than later. And Dr. Roselle, I mean, you know, this, this was a man who was president at the University of Kentucky at one time. Brilliant individual, brilliant why did you do that? And I always tell people, I don't recommend like you disobeying your boss within the first 30 seconds of being on the job. But I said to him, listen, I said, in the back of that, in the back of that press conference, there was 80 football players that wanted to hear what my vision was. And I wasn't going to tell them we're going to rebuild. I wasn't going to tell them that, hey, maybe in four and five years. I said, no, they needed to know that I wanted to win right now. And I did the same thing when I got here to Sam Houston. I said the, pretty much the exact same words. I said, I'm here to win a national championship and we will win it sooner rather than later. And again, I felt the same way. I saw in the background, I saw all those, you know, players wanting to know who's this, who's this guy from the East Coast? Who's this new head coach? We just lost a really successful guy that took us to two national championship games, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. And who's this guy? And what, what's his mindset? And I wanted to let him know right up front, you know, it's not okay to be okay. That's not the world I live in. We're trying to be national champions. And so I, I set the standard and, and I think, you know, people sometimes can get, um, I, I put it this way, I, I apologize to, to the staff sometimes when I say, listen, guys, I know it put, it put us under a lot of pressure. I said, but you know what? I mean, really, you're, you're under pressure no matter what. So me saying that the goal of the program is win a national championship, trust me, overall, it's a, it's a good thing versus a bad thing. But just understand, you have, that's the mentality we have. Now moving into Conference USA, I mean, the goal is to, to go be a bowl winner and try to get to the highest bowl you can. 
Um, so yeah, I, I have no problem setting a high standard and, and trying to get our guys to live by it. Now, you guys went 21 and one in, in the calendar year of 2021, you know, probably the, the most accomplished, you know, calendar year in football, college football history, you know, in five, 10 years, what do you think you'll be the most proud of for that group and just everything that they were able to accomplish, not only just on the field, but I'd imagine behind the scenes is playing 22 football games, going through two training camps. That can't be easy. No, it's something a book could be written on. I mean, people don't realize unless you've studied what we did, that we also did this without a locker room, you know, our facility being rebuilt. And so I remember Bobby Williams saying to me, Hey, you know, we're, we're redoing this facility. And the only time to do it's in the spring, your players got to do their own laundry. We got it. Your players are going to have to like take their equipment home. We got it. Game day. We're going to have to put them up in the weight room, you know, and they're going to walk down the visitor side. We got it. I mean, it was just one of those things where every obstacle, every adversity, and every obstacle became an opportunity. And so that's what I'm most proud of, of all the things that we worked through. We lost our offensive line coach and defensive line coach 30 days before the start of the season. You know, we had an historic snowstorm that there's no, I don't know if you know this, there's no snow shovels in Huntsville, Texas. I had to go buy feed shovels at the low school feed, feed and grain store. And it took us four days to shovel out our practice or our game field so we could practice. So there's so many things that we went through that just brought us closer and closer and closer together. And so it was one of the most remarkable experiences of my life. On top of that, we're going through COVID. And so, you know, you're getting tested three times a week and, you know, going through all those things. And, you know, if I, my players heard the word COVID protocol one more time, they're going to strangle me. So that, that whole experience was really just it, it, something a, a movie made out of. It's something, a, it's a storybook sort of situation. And uh, for us to have, you know, what we consider the greatest calendar year in the history of college football, winning three conference championships. Think about that. We won the Southland in the spring, won the WAC in the fall, and then we won the Ace Sun WAC Challenge for the automatic qualifier. No one's ever going to win three conference championships in a calendar year. No one's going to win 21 games in a calendar year ever again. So I told our players, you know, 10 years from now, when we come back for our, you know, reunion, um, we're going to be the ones who built this place. And we're going to be very proud of, of what we did. And there's going to be 30,000 students at Sam Houston, and they're going to be playing big time college football. And uh, it's going to be exciting and to know that we were part of the impetus to kind of move this program forward. Before I let you go, just a couple of kind of quick, fun questions. I saw a picture of you when you were playing and you had a pretty awesome mustache that I'm jealous because I cannot grow facial hair in that manly of a way. Have you ever thought about bringing that back, you know, like maybe for the last Battle of the Piney Woods or something? Yeah, that probably would stimulate a divorce immediately. So we, I think there's a clause in my contract that says mustache divorce so no my wife does not want to see the mustache back i've tried to bring a goatee back a couple of times but some grays come in here and so she's like you look like an old man like you look ridiculous so i've i've stayed away from it for the most part and as we've established she's responsible for your career uh, you're gonna have to listen to her and absolutely, and that, right? absolutely. Uh, this is one of the first times i've seen you without sunglasses yeah no ready i got them there we go how many sunglasses do you own? Oh, there was a point where I probably had about a hundred and I put them on my, on my desk. And so when recruits would come in, but I, but the reality is I do have sensitive eyes. And so I wore sunglasses uh, in 2003, won the national championship. The lights were just like, you know, on in my eyes. And I was, and so I've even worn sunglasses at night and I get that, you know, whole, sunglasses at night sort of thing, right. but I do have very sensitive eyes. And so sunglasses are an important part of my wardrobe every day. And then lastly, you know, you're, you're one of the few guys that have won a championship as a player and, and as a coach, I'm curious kind of how those feelings compare and contrast. What are, if there are any differences between the feelings of, of kind of experiencing that? I don't know. You know, I am so ingrained with our players that I think when they win, I'm part of that winning. When, when they lose, I'm part of that losing. And I always say when I recruit, you know, when we win, we win. When we lose, we lose. We do this together as a family. Uh, so I've enjoyed, I mean, I, one of my great moments was uh, doing the interview 
post winning the national championship this past in 2021 uh, and my players looking for me and them seeing me across the field and them all running over and beating me up. And I love those moments with, with, with the guys. I mean, because we do share so much time together and there's so many things we do together. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I was out of coaching for a year and I, I could have gone on through the, you know, the broadcast world. Um, but I'm so glad I came back to, to coaching college football because uh, I just love the impact you can make on young men and the memories that you can share with them forever. And uh, again, Sam Houston's been awesome to me. All right, coach. I really appreciate the time. And uh, I plan on coming out there in the summer and kind of doing a, you know, some big story on kind of the evolution of Sam Houston, you know, moving up into to the FBS ranks. Awesome. Appreciate right. it. Thanks. Thanks, sir. See y'all later.